Welcome. I'm Adam Cutler, Senior Rabbi of Adith Israel Congregation, and it is our great pleasure to host Barry Weiss, We Need to Talk, a unique Q&A event. This evening's program is part of the Anne and Joseph Bogorosh Memorial Lecture Series. Anne and Joe were integrod, integral and beloved members of the Adith Israel community. And we are very grateful for the support of Melanie and Richard Bogorosh, without which programs like this would not be possible. I wanna tell you that I am very excited for tonight. I've had the privilege of knowing this evening's guest speaker and the rest of the Weiss sisters since our childhood days at Camp Ramah, and then later watched from a few blocks away as Barry began to make a name for herself as a student at Columbia. It only took two years, but I finally got her to do a program for Adith Israel. I know that Barry won't disappoint, and neither will our excellent moderator, Susan Jackson, who I've only known for about 20 years. Please note that tonight's presentation is a private and exclusive program for our invited guests. It will not be live streamed and the press will not be in attendance. A video of the program will be available for guests within a couple of days. It is now my pleasure to call upon Richard Bogorosh to introduce our featured speaker. Before I introduce our moderator, Susan Jackson, and our special guest, Barry Weiss, I would be remiss if I do not express my thanks and appreciation to Joe Traeger, a board member of the synagogue, and his team for organizing this event. I'd like to take a few moments talking about this lecture series. This is the second event in, an, in the Anne and Joseph Bogorosh Memorial Lecture Series, which my wife Melanie and I established in honor of my late parents. Our goal in establishing this lecture series is to provide a forum for discussion and debate of issues of importance to our community by, doing, by inviting speakers with a diversity of opinions and outlooks who we hope will inform, educate, and inspire. At any rate, that is our aim. The speaker series came about following the death of my father, Joseph Bogorosh, in February 2018. Many of you who are members of Ad Adath Israel Congregation knew him well and knew the important role that he played in the life of this congregation and in the wider community. My wife, Melody, and I decided that it would be a fitting tribute to him and to my late mother, Anne, who unfortunately died in November 1998, who instilled in me and in my three sisters a strong and abiding connection to Israel, a love of Jewish traditions and history, and pride in being Jewish. That is the motivation for the establishment of this lecture series, which I hope will continue to benefit our community. I would now like to introduce Susan Jackson, the moderator for tonight's event. There are few people who require no introduction, and Susan is one of them. She's a vice president of volunteer talent management at UJA Federation, and is responsible for all aspects pertaining to Israel. Her passion for the Jewish community is well known, and her contributions are so numerous that time does not permit a more fulsome review of her accomplishments. She is highly accomplished and a tremendous, tremendous asset to the Jewish community. She will moderate the discussion following Barry Weiss's remarks. Thank you, Susan, for agreeing to moderate this event. I'd now like to say a few words about our guest speaker, Barry Weiss. Well, I've never met her, I've read many of her articles that appeared in the New York Times and before that in Tablet Magazine. I don't know if you can see behind me, if I'll lift it up, maybe you can't, a picture of uh, Winston, there's a Karsh photograph of Winston Churchill. This photograph was taken by Yosef Karsh in 1941 when Churchill came to Canada and made an address before the Canadian Parliament. It's a very famous photograph, I hope it can be seen. And what it does is it captures Churchill's determination, his defiance, and his conviction that no matter how difficult the task would be, the British people would never give in and never give up. Churchill exemplified courage, as does our guest speaker. She is a person of conviction, courage, and determination. Until recently, she was an editor and columnist of the New York Times, and prior to that worked at the Wall Street Journal and as I mentioned, Tablet Magazine. 
She's the author of the bestseller, How to Fight Antisemitism, which is a very important book and I commend to you. Almost two months ago, on July, on July 14th, Barry resigned from the New York Times in a resignation letter that has attracted widespread comment, attention, and controversy. As a proud Jew and a strong supporter of Israel, her views were met with hostility and hatred at the New York Times. A bullying and toxic work environment led to her resignation. It took great courage to resign from one of the premier positions in American journalism, and it took courage to speak out. It is a great pleasure through the magic of Zoom that she's here to speak to us today. Before turning the, the program over to Susan, I and my wife would like to wish all members of the Adath Israel community and the wider community a happy and healthy new year. May 5781 be much better year than 5780. I'll say amen to that. Amen. Thank you very much. Well, Richard, thank you for that beautiful introduction. And um, Torontonians will know that I am genuine when I say that there's really no Jewish community that I feel more at home in other than, of course, my hometown of Pittsburgh. And it's especially wonderful to be introduced by the guy I think of as Chaim's older brother, which is Adam. And I remember so clearly Adam um, during uh, Shabbat at Camp, Shabbatot at Camp Rama in Canada, how he would do this thing that I thought was so weird at the time. He would give brachot to all of these campers. So it was like he was probably 14 or 15 years old, he seemed older at the time. And it was just so clear um, that there was no place for him other than the rabbinate. And so it's so exciting to me um, to see him leading all of you. So really, I, I couldn't be happier to be with all of you tonight, even though, of course, it kind of sucks that we're not in the same room. So I, I, I'll talk for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll go to Q&A, and I'm sure we'll get into the times and all of that. But um, I'm struck that, you know, a year ago to the day, so September 10th last year, I published my book, How to Fight Anti-Semitism. Uh, and it brings me no pleasure to say that I think that the arguments that I made in that book and the framing um, are more relevant than, than ever. When I wrote that book, I wrote it in kind of a passion. Um, it was following the attack, of course, that you'll all remember, on Tree of Life, the synagogue in Pittsburgh, really in the heart of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, where I had become a bat mitzvah. And back then, not a year ago, I would say, and it sounds glib to say it, but I had the luxury of keeping track. I could recite the names of every American Jew who had been murdered, every American Jew who had been assaulted, and many of the men, women, and even children that had been denigrated for the sin of being Jewish. Um, and I have to tell you that I can't do that anymore. And it's not because I'm not paying attention. It's not because of lack of effort or caring. It's because the wave of Jew hatred has gotten so, so big. And it's reached corners of American life that even a year ago seemed untouchable to me. If I'm guilty of anything, it was sort of a failure of the imagination. Um, I'll just go through some of the numbers. So this year, the biggest cities in the country, which are New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, saw each of them saw the most hate crimes against Jews than they had since 2001. Across the country, according to the FBI, 60% of hate crimes are carried out against Jews. And of course, we represent less than 3% of the population here. And in New York City, where I have lived proudly for the past 15 years, other than a year in Jerusalem, more than half of hate crimes in the first quarter of 2020 were anti-Semitic attacks, according to the NYPD. So it's really gone from sort of a trickle to a torrent. And the, the neat sort of precise divisions that I laid out in my book the three-headed monster of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism that emanates from the far left, from the far right, and from the precincts of radical Islam, they have increasingly blurred. So when a hashtag like Jewish privilege trends on Twitter, is it clear that if that originates from the far left or the far right? It seems to me it could be either. When synagogues are marred with free Palestine or F Israel, is that the obvious work of the left or the right? 
when a sign hangs above the 405 freeway in Los Angeles, this is, which is the city I'm now living in for the time being, and the sign declares Jews want a race war, it's just as easy to imagine that that sign was painted by a white supremacist as it is that that sign was painted by a follow of someone like Louis Farrakhan. I wish I could sit here and report to you that the ubiquity of American anti-Semitism has inspired a mass movement, has inspired marches in the street, but I fear instead that its ubiquity has had a numbing effect on many of us. When I tell strangers that I'm from Pittsburgh, many of them sort of flash with recognition. They might not remember the name Tree of Life. Surely they don't remember the 11 souls who were taken from us that day, but they know that a terrible thing happened there. And they sort of pause and recognize um, and acknowledge the travesty. But how many of my fellow Americans or even my fellow American Jews or North American Jews, if I said to you, I'm from Jersey City, how many would remember that it was there on December 10th, 2019, that two followers of the Black Hebrew Israelites, a hate group named David Anderson and Francine Graham, that they killed four innocent people in a kosher supermarket on Martin Luther King Drive. I went there the day after the shooting when there was sort of glass shattered everywhere. And it sort of stopped my heart to see that just to the left of that kosher supermarket was a cheder for young kids, one flight up. It's a miracle that more people weren't killed that day. And later, the, the, Fed, the FBI discovered um, a bomb in the truck of these two individuals who were motivated by their hatred of police officers and Jews. And the bomb had enough material that it could have reached across five football fields. I wonder how many people hear the name Muncie and remember that it was in that town on December 28, 2019, that a sort of scene out of the old world took place not an hour's drive from Midtown Manhattan. For those who will recall, it was on that night, the seventh night of Hanukkah, that there were about 100 Jews gathered in the home of Rabbi Chaim Rottenberg to celebrate Hanukkah. And around 10 PM, a man burst in with a scarf tied around his face and a machete the size of a broomstick. And he started hacking at people. How many non-Jews hear the name Brooklyn and don't think of great restaurants and cool coffee shops and hipsters but think instead of the kind of rolling pogrom that has unfolded there, especially in neighborhoods like Borough Park and Crown Heights against the city's most visible Jews. How many think of someone like Abraham Gopin, whose face was smashed with a paving stone? How many think of the young mother assaulted in front of her four-year-old child or of the man hit in the head with a Slurpee that I could go down the line? And then there are the crimes that don't even make the headlines. I will never forget when I heard from a friend about him being beaten on the Lower East Side because he was wearing a kippah, or the email I received from a friend of mine saying that her father-in-law had been beaten on the Upper East Side by a man yelling, Jew bastard. When a young woman this year confessed to me that she was reading my book on the subway, but then she thought better of it and decided to cover up the cover so no one would harass her, I wish I could have told her that she was being paranoid. Now, these, of course, are the most obvious attacks, the physical attacks, the ones that are hardest to pretend away. But the intellectual, the social, the political assault on Jews and on the Jewish state have become a new normal, just as Zoom meetings and life lived behind masks have become the new normal. The conspiracy theories that until a few years ago were contained on the lunatic fringe, they have fully permeated the mainstream. And they have fastened themselves there, increasingly unchallenged by our leaders and, of course, helped along by social media in which fake news and untruths fed much, spread, viral, spread in a viral way much faster than the truth. What is the new normal? The new normal is one in which the, Texan, the Texas Republican Party has adopted the slogan, we are the storm which is a nod to the insane and increasingly widespread conspiracy theory of QAnon. The new normal is, which is one in which our president is asked about the group, and he says, I don't know much about the movement, but I under understand they like me very much, which I appreciate. The new normal is a celebrity like Chelsea Handler praising Louis Farrakhan on Instagram. It's P. Diddy hosting Louis Farrakhan on July 4th to give an Independence Day address on Revolt TV. 
The new normal is Eagles wide receiver Deshaun Jackson posting that Jews will blackmail America. And Steven Jackson, the former NBA player, saying, you know who the Rothschilds are. The new normal is the Democratic Party condemning Linda Sarsour only 24 hours later to turn around and walk it back. The new normal is the Democratic Socialists of America, the emerging power center of the Democratic Party, much as the Tea Party once was for the Republican Party, which has transformed it, sending a questionnaire to New York City Council candidates, including a, including a pledge that they would not travel to Israel. The new normal is the DSA's New York co-chair refusing to answer a journalist's question about whether Israel had a right to exist. I could go on, but you get the picture. And what is perhaps puzzling is that amongst all of this surging hate against Jews, it is happening against the backdrop of the most powerful, sustained, and widespread movement for racial justice in America since the 1960s. And that, of course, is the movement that declares Black Lives Matter. Anyone honest about American history knows that there are two groups in this country who have gotten a very, very terrible deal and that is Native Americans and African Americans. The answer in Europe is the Jews. It's a totally different story, but here it is Native Americans and African Americans. And American Jews, like all Americans who know their American history, know that. And we grow, grew up with intense pride in the Jewish place in the civil rights movement. What Jewish child does not have intense pride at the picture of Abraham Joshua Heschel marching with Martin Luther King? What American Jewish child doesn't know the story of Andrew Goodman or of Michael Schwarmer, murdered, of course, by the KKK in 1964 in the Mississippi Freedom Summer? And so the BLM movement, given American Jewish history, it is a movement that the majority of American Jews are keen to support. And so the natural thing would be to shout Black Lives Matter because it's inarguable. Of course, Black Lives Matter. That's why it's such a powerful slogan. It's inarguable. And to the extent that the Black Lives Matter movement is about saying that Black lives are undervalued and we need to correct that, I'm on board. To the extent that it's about better training for the police, I'm for it. To the extent that it's about demanding equality of opportunity for all Americans, I'm on board. The problem is the chasm between the slogan and some of the core policy movements of the policy ideas of the movement. The movement believes that capitalism is racism. The movement calls for abolishing or defunding the police, and the movement calls for the dismantling of the nuclear family. I don't support those policies. So where does that leave me? The movement is also deeply informed, and this is, this is sort of an esoteric idea, but I'll try and simplify it, by an ideology once contained to uh, particular departments at universities, which is now quite widespread, which is called critical race theory or anti-racism. And the problem with critical race theory or anti-racism is that it sees the world crudely. It sees it in terms of black and white. And in North America, right, and this is where this movement poses a particular conundrum for Jews, the majority of us are, uh, the majority of us are Ashkenazi. And so we, in this movement, we become white or white adjacent. We benefit from the privileges of whiteness. And so the entire history of the Jewish people is collapsed into this one frame, which is the word whiteness. And so we become exactly the same as our white neighbor next door. Moreover, according to, according to those who ascribe to critical race theory, Jews are, complicit, are complicit in the ultimate modern sin, the sin of colonialism. Why? Because we support what they say is the last standing bastion of white colonialism in the Middle East, which is, of course, the state of Israel. When you understand this ideology, you understand how San Francisco State University is about to host a Palestinian terrorist, a hijacker named Leila Khalid, at an event moderated by a professor of the university who says that Zionists are white nationalists. When you understand this ideology, you understand how Rose Rich, a heroic young Jewish woman, was just forced out of the student government at USC because she is a Zionist. 
you understand how a group fronted by Angela Davis, Angela Davis, who is currently the subject of a puff piece in Vanity Fair, how she, along with Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors, started a group called Black Solidarity with Palestine that demands unified action against the related evils of anti-Blackness, white supremacy, and of course, Zionism. It is how the state of California, home to so many Mizrahi Jews, has not included Mizrahi Jews in their history in its proposed ethnic studies requirement for its school system. And it is why here in Los Angeles, a synagogue was recently vandalized with graffiti that read, Free Palestine and F Israel. The watchwords right now of right thinking, progressive, righteous social circles and institutions are diversity, inclusion, and justice. But that inclusion does not seem to extend to Jews. Those demands for justice never seem to include demands for justice for anti-Semites. And diversity? Well, we're about as diverse as saltine crackers. The Jews in this movement are being erased, or rather, to be more precise, we are being whited out. And the problem is that many of our leaders including some of our religious leaders, seem to me complicit in that process. I'll give you just one example. Last month, I'm sure many of you have seen what's been unfolding in American cities on the news. So last month, sort of the, the hotbed of protesting, many of, many of, much of the protesting violent happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So it was erupting in protests after a police officer shot a black man named Jacob Blake seven times in the back. And during that protest, a historic synagogue in Kenosha was graffitied with the words, free Palestine. What did the rabbi of that synagogue say when she was asked for comment? She said, that's a trivial matter. A trivial matter. I don't think it's a trivial matter. If a mosque was defaced in the process of another kind of protest for justice, if a church was defaced, if a gay community, community center was defaced, would we ever say it was trivial? It is not. Instead, we should follow the lead of a football player from my hometown of Pittsburgh, a Steelers player, Zach Brown, who said this summer, I want to preach to the black and brown community that we need to uplift the Jews and we need to put our arms around them just as much when we talk about BLM and when we talk about elevating ourselves, he said. We can't move forward, forward while allowing ourselves to leave another minority group in the dark. I need to say amen to that. Um, and there's so much more to talk about, but, I, but I'm, this, is, this is, I think, the topic that's on many, many people's minds at the moment. But I will um, leave it to the, our wonderful moderator to sort of take it from here. All right. All right, Barrett, that was great. There was an awful lot of information and an awful lot to chew on in that statement. I'm going to do housekeeping first. So everybody who's sure. on the line, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you hover, hover with your mouse, you'll see there are a number of things. Participants, Q&A, chat, and share screen. If you, you go to the Q&A, you can type in any question you'd like. It's blown up already. I have dozens of questions in there already. So if you want to ask a question, hover over it. T uh, click on it and type your question. I'm going to apologize right up front because there are so many in there already. There is no way unless we're here till next Thursday, just there of Yantif, we won't be able to answer all the questions. So I'm going to pick out a couple of them and then maybe even stray a bit because there's some that are a little bit off topic, but they're definitely uh, Barry Weiss questions for sure. Okay. okay. So the first one here that I see that came up, which I thought was really interesting, um, is a, a real question about balance. How did, what in your opinion is the balance between all the investments that a community makes in education and camping and identity programs and what they need to invest in terms of the anti-Semitism area, the area that you were talking about in the area we were focusing on. How do you, what is the, what's the advice you would give to a community about that kind of balance? That's a great question and I'll answer it, you know, in hopefully my typically characteristically blunt way, which is don't focus on anti-Semitism almost at all. And here's what I mean by that. When a Jew's identity, and I see this increasingly, is built around fear, is based around being an anti-anti-Semite, we are lost. The Jewish people were not put on earth to be anti-anti-Semites. We were not put on earth to fight assholes, excuse my language, on the internet and to convince them that we are human. 
we were put on earth to be Jews. And the only way, sort of just like brass tacks, bottom lining it, the only way in the end to fight anti-Semitism is by digging deep into who we are and seeing our Jewishness, our Judaism, our membership in the Jewish people, our inheritance as a source of unbelievable pride and nourishment. The thing that I think where we have failed young people, I, obviously one of the questions I get a lot, especially from sort of the baby boomer generation is, why are so many young people sort of turning their backs on Israel when they get to college campuses? Well, frankly, at least in the States and I imagine in Canada, most young Americans, their experience of Judaism is soulless Hebrew school and the fetish um, and, and sort of Israel turned into a two-dimensional fetish object, right? Where, as Mati Friedman, the Israeli writer, has said, Israel haters hate a place that doesn't exist, and often Israel lovers love a place that doesn't exist. If that is your experience of Judaism, right? If it's just sort of about falafel, and these people hate us, and oh, I have to ugh, learn this trope from my bar mitzvah, it's a, it's a failing strategy. If, however, someone enters a challenging, or let's say even a hostile environment, and they have grown up in an environment, and I feel like we talk a lot about privilege. I am a daughter of privilege because I grew up with a sense from Camp Ramah, from the Schechter Day School I went to, from all of the trips to Israel my parents took us on, and most importantly, because of the discussions that happened every single Friday night around our Shabbat table, that being a Jew was the greatest privilege in the entire world. And I really feel that. I feel like it is the honor of my lifetime. And so when I enter into a challenging situation along the lines of ones that I encountered at the New York Times, there's no question to me about where my priorities lie, who I'm fighting for, and what values I'm fighting for. And so I would say to those educators on the call or the parents, the best thing you can do for your kids is give them that sense. Judaism, not a burden, not an obligation, but an honor and a blessing. And the deeper you can anchor your child in that worldview and really that emotional experience, um, the, the better off we will be. I think that is the number one thing we can be focused on. Terrific. So I have a question here. So in, in everything you've seen, you've traveled, you've had discussions all over the place. Have you found anyone that's got traction, anything, any concept and idea that's had traction and changing minds and is any of that gathering support? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that there are really interesting alliances. I just got off the phone with a rabbi from Chicago who is a rabbi in Chicago and he's very close in building an alliance with a bunch of pastors who live on the South side, took them to Israel. They encountered a group that works with PTSD victims of um, the Intifada in Israel. I forget the acronym of the group. I can let people know later. And they actually brought that group to the South side of Chicago to work with the black population there that unfortunately um, gun violence is absolutely endemic in that community. So those kind of initiatives I think are, are quite powerful. Um, another group that I would really recommend to people is a group called Zioness. I wish that I could be in the room and, and ask people to raise their hands for who's heard of them. But I think Zioness is an extremely powerful movement because they approach um, sort of the progressive landscape as progressives. And they go into environments, let's say like the Dyke March in DC, fully as progressives and as Zionists. So I think there's a lot to recommend that. Um, I also think, you know, the kind of personal relationships, um, I think go tremendously far, much more than social media campaigns or fancy hashtags. Um, and I think the more, I don't, I cannot emphasize this enough, the more we refuse to cut off parts of our identity and the more we insist on entering any room we enter as our whole full selves, the more powerful that example is. I can't tell you the number of people who are living increasingly closeted Jewish lives in the freest societies the Jews have ever been a part of. They're not closeted in their gender expression or their sexual orientation. They're closeted in their Jewishness and they're especially closeted in their Zionism. I would say the people that give me the most hope on this score, I mentioned one in my earlier remarks, that young woman, Rose Rich, 
but there's the example of the young woman at McGill, I believe her name is Jordan Wright. There's the example of Blake Flayton at George Washington. These are 19, 20, and 21 year olds, and they are the future leaders of the Jewish community. And they are saying, no, we refuse to erase part of ourselves. We refuse to cut off part of our limbs. Uh, we refuse to contort ourselves um, to fit in with the prevailing sort of, to, to fit in at the cool kids table really is the best way of putting it. Um, so I would say that if we're looking for hope and looking for inspiration, they are who I look to. They energize me. They give me a sense that we are actually in, in good hands. Which is a wonderful thing to hear. Really does give us light at the end of the tunnel. So I have dozens and dozens of questions along this line. So I'm going to have to give you one. So this one is after your resignation from the New York Times, you knew that would come at some point. Of course. Uh, did the leadership of of course, it had to, right? Did the leadership of the Times reach out to you to get you to change your mind, or did any of them have any interesting um, anecdotes and things they wanted to talk to you about along that vein? Um, the answer is no, but that is because by the time I got to the door, things had really um, broken down to such an extent that me staying wasn't really possible. Um, I want to just say, I guess, I'll say a few things about the times and you can feel free to, I'm sure there's lots of questions about it. The New York Times was never a comfortable environment for me, as people can imagine. But the, the platform, right, was so significant. And the job I was asked to do, I felt so important. You know, people only see the kind of columns that I wrote and the speaking, the speaking gigs that I do. That's like 20% of what I did there. The other 80% was to bring in voices that would not other, otherwise appear in the New York Times. Heterodox voices, conservative voices, libertarian voices, Zionist voices, people like Yossi Klein Halevi, people like Chloe Valdari, people like Ayan Hirsi Ali, people like Mati Friedman. And so getting the cold shoulder in the cafeteria or having people say rude things to me or even say things about me in company-wide forums that seemed worthwhile as long as I could do my job. What changed and the thing that ultimately um, sort of forced my hand um, and sort of the reason I showed, sh ultimately showed myself to the door was that not only was I having to put up with that kind of consistent bullying, but I couldn't do my job anymore. Um, that everything sort of shifted when um, my boss, who was a storied editor at the paper, he'd been there for two decades, he had been the Jerusalem bureau chief, when he was forced to resign, for what? For running an op-ed by a sitting United States senator who was a Republican. So all of a sudden you have the paper of record in which the views of Tom Cotton, who might very well be a contender for the Republican presidential, um, nom be, be the Republican presidential nominee in 2024, his view is not acceptable, but an op-ed that runs under the headline, yes, we mean literally abolish the police, is acceptable. And I basically decided that in order to stay, it was clear to me that I was going to have to significantly um, censor myself, write about only an increasingly limited number of topics, and I certainly was not going to be able to get ki the, the kind of op-eds not three years ago through the door, through the door. And it felt to me like given the urgency of this moment in the world and certainly in the country that I love, that that bargain just wasn't worth the price. And frankly, that there are things and values worth standing up for that are way more important than prestige. And the truth of the matter is it's morals, it's values, but there's courage there too, Barry. And I think that that's something today we don't always see. And that's something that we're all very proud to hear whenever you're talking. So now I'm gonna to move to one, to something else completely and away from that because you must be very tired of that topic. No, it's okay. I, I, people, I understand why people wanna know about it. I think it's very relevant to a lot of people because right, there's, there's this tension between, the, and, and I've always toggled back and forth between these two poles in my life, between reforming institutions that are flawed from within and starting new institutions. And I would say three years ago, after the election of Donald Trump, I was very much of the mentality of, of course the New York Times is biased. Anyone with eyes can see that, but 
it's such an important platform and it's such an important institution in this country. And so many people rely on it that it's worth sort of going into the lion's den and doing the work that I, I think successfully did for a while. And now I'm in a different place. Now I'm in a place of the New York Times has the same title and it has the same font, but a lot like a, a other American institutions, and we can go further into this, it's kind of, um, it's been transformed from within. And I now find myself in a place of, okay, the New York Times that I walked into is no longer that same New York Times. And now I, I consider it my obligation to be part of building new journalistic projects and institutions that pick up the flag that I think the New York Times and other media organizations in this country have put down. And that's the flag of adult, patriotic, nuanced, complicated journalism that trusts adults enough to tell them the truth about the world rather than pushing a particular narrative. Oh, that's wonderful, true enough. Okay, how do you think we should address the curriculum in the school system when it shifts from criticism of Israel to anti-Israelism and anti-Semitism? That's a really good question. I'll start with higher education where, um, frankly, it shocks me at some of these schools that are sort of overrun um, with, again, it's not criticism of Israel, it's, it's anti-Semitism masquerading as something else, or as Judea Pearl has called it, Zion, Zionophobia. I don't really care about the nomenclature, um, but it shocks me that so many Jews are still donating to these universities. Why would you give to something that undermines your most fundamental values? Um, and I would also say that, you know, Jews, it's, it's, an, it's an irony because we're, our stereo, the stereotype of us is being pushy. But I also think a lot of times we want to get along. We don't want to be the loudmouth Jews who caused a stir. And I guess what I would say to all of you is make a ruckus. Be the skunk at the garden party. Time is late. We are in a very, we're in a very precarious moment. I don't want to scare anyone, but th that's really what I think. And so um, now's not the time to shut up and sit on your hands. Now is the time to demand the kind of dignity and respect that we always demand for other minorities, demanding it for ourselves. And if it doesn't work out, I would say that radical solutions are called for. I spoke to someone the other day who's starting a new university. I'm talking, you know, I look at something like um, the Tikva Fund that's running these amazing online courses in um, philosophy and Jewish history. Um, maybe that in the next couple of years will develop into a fully fledged, incredible um, Jewish school. Um, those are the kind of things I think, I think we need to be thinking, I've said this in talks before, I think we need to be thinking Zionistically. And what I mean by that is I think we need to have more audaciousness and sometimes, yes, more radical approaches um, when the institutions that we're a part of don't seem to grant us the respect that we deserve. So maybe let's take that question. There are a bunch of questions along the line. Uh, how do you see and how do you think we need to be dealing with the next gen, with the millennials and the generation younger than millennials, who have actually grown up on the media and grown up on the anti-Israel pieces of, of society and the BDS movement and war and all of the rhetoric that they hear. Any advice for those parents before they send them off to university and any advice to the ones, one of these questions was terrific, when they come over as young adults and sometimes with their young children, as families around that Shabbat table, what should that conversation be? How do you reach out to them and how do you talk about Jewish identity and about Israel? So this is like the most important and sensitive question. So I would say that um, I put the sort of unity of the Jewish people, that's like in, that, that should be among our, our top priorities. And I think that unlike the prevailing culture at the moment um, in which it's sort of incredibly polarized and one tribe against another tribe, in my country, it's the red team versus the blue team. I'm sure it's different in Canada. Um, we have a counterculture to that. And our counterculture, right, is the machloka. It's the chavruta. It's Hillel and Shammai. Why is Hillel given the sort of upper hand over Shammai? Partially, it's maybe because he had better arguments, but it's because the school of Hillel taught the school of Shammai's argument first. And I think that 
when we're talking amongst our Shabbat tables and amongst our family, it is very, very important that that is the kind of way that we argue with one another from a place of love and respect and frankly, from a countercultural place. We should be trying to use that kind of values, those kind of values to influence the prevailing culture rather than us adopting the kind of freeze out your family member if you don't agree with me that seems to be increasingly in force, at least in a lot of the circles I travel in. But I would say that there are also limits, right? And there, it's clear in Judaism what the religious limits are. If someone says, I believe in Jesus, we say, great, you're a wonderful person, but you're no longer a Jew. And I think, it's, um, I think there are political limits too, but they're much more difficult to discuss. When Naturi Karta goes and meets with the Ayatollahs in Iran, they are putting a target on the backs of other Jews. When Jews claim that the Jewish people has no um, indigenous roots in the land of Israel, a historically revisionist statement that undermines the literal facts in the ground, the rocks, the archaeology. You know, is that outside the bounds of what is sort of normative Judaism? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a question we need to be um, confronting, but I know that it's a very, very hard one because these fissures, they don't just run inside of Jewish communities, they often run inside of our families. Um, when it comes to Israel specifically, you know, I think it's just, I think it's very important to arm our kids uh, with the truth, right? And what do I mean by that? The, one of the most kind of famous left-wing critiques of America is that book by Howard Zinn, The People's History of the United States. And that's a really useful book for an, 11, uh, an 11th grader who's about to, you, you know, who's about to go to a college campus where they're going to learn that, you know, all kinds of things about America. But you wouldn't give that book to a fourth grader, a fifth grader, or a sixth grader, right? You want them first to learn about the Constitution, to learn about the way that the American promise and the American project is a departure from history. How even with all of our flaws, we are a country in which the lane you are born into is not the lane you are condemned to, unlike so many other places, of course, in history, but, but in the world right now. And you want eventually when they reach the sort of maturity to encounter criticism, that it's coming, it's, that it comes on, on what is already a foundation of love. And I think one of the problems is you, you're, we're giving kids a kind of two-dimensional story, and then all of a sudden they're on a college campus and they're learning, huh? They're learning that, you know, about BDS, they're learning that Israel is the last standing bastion of white colonialism, they're learning canards that are essentially modern blood libels about um, the Israeli military training the American police forces and on and on and on. And so I think it's a delicate dance, right? We don't want to be teaching that kind of criticism to our kids at a young age, but I think it's, um, I think high school, high schools, especially um, Jewish uh, history teachers in high schools have a particularly um, challenging but creative task ahead for them. True enough. Okay, back to a little more of what you talked about in the same way as Jews have supported black causes and those communities of color, how do we engage the black community and other communities of color to stand with us against anti-Semitism? First, by standing up for ourselves. First, by standing up for ourselves. You know, it took, it took a Hanukkah from hell, frankly, in which there, were, there was like a hate crime every single night this past Hanukkah for the Jews to finally organize a march that went from Manhattan to Brooklyn to stand up for ourselves. Why did it take so long? Why are we so embarrassed um, to raise our own banner, to declare our rights to live freely and to not be scared to walk down an American street with a kippah on our head? I think that it begins with ourselves and self-dignity and the insistence on being a whole Jew. Um, and I think that too often right now, I'm witnessing um, sort of a really ugly trend, which is sort of what I think of as, as self-mutilation. And it's a trend with a very long and sordid history. Let me give you an example of what I mean, without getting too graphic. During sort of the, when Judea was run 2000 years ago 
by the Hellenists, right? I'm talking about the time of the Maccabees. There were some Jews who lived in Judea at that time who were so desperate to participate in the outdoor games, right? The gymnasium in which exercise happened in the nude, that they actually went through the horrifyingly painful procedure of undoing their circumcisions so they could fit in with the other people. So they would not be outed as Jews. So they would fit in. And I see, and this has a long history, we can go you know, to the Yvesexia um, under Stalin, the group that was so eager to show their fealty to Stalinism that they, uh, that they persecuted their fellow Jews with a special fervor to show that they were willing to even do that. Why do I point all of this out? I point all of this out not to suggest that you know, people today are undoing their circumcisions or even that there's a moral comparison, but simply to say that the pressure on Jews right now to sort of convert into anti-Zionism uh, in order to be part of the progressive coalition of the righteous and of the, um, and of the coalition of the victims is incredibly strong. And I think, that, um, I think that that is something that we need to, to resist. And that takes us back to the original question about Jewish education, because the only way we can ask people to resist that, because, because it's extremely seductive, who doesn't want to be part of that movement, um, who doesn't want to do the easy thing and kind of um, erase a part of themselves in order to be part of something that is quite meaningful. And I think we need to acknowledge that. Um, the, only, the, the only hope for being able to resist it is strong Jewish identity and a sense of Jewish history and a sense of our place really in Jewish history and our obligation to it. So there's a number of people who are very curious about what's next for Barry. What are you thinking about your own career, where you're going, the things that you're thinking about, the steps you're looking to take, and new and different, or perhaps the same sort of things that you're taking on? A lot of different questions, but all in the same vein, coming at me very, very quickly. So everyone is curious, Barry, what's next? Well, um, right now, you know, I'm working on the afterwards of the paperback version of my book. Then I have you know, another book deal um, that I need to work on. Um, but I'll, I'll, say, I'll answer it in a sort of a big picture way. Right now, as I mentioned before, we're, we're sort of living through the unraveling of trust in newspapers like the New York Times. I don't cheer on that unraveling because we need the New York Times. And what I mean by that is we need newspapers, we need publications, we need podcasts, we need television stations that tell the truth as the Times slogan has it without fear or favor. That is extremely important. Without that, you cannot have a healthy democracy. And there is a, re there is a, di there's a direct correlation between the sort of um, really scary unraveling of democratic norms in this country and the lack of trust um, in the places that we rely on to tell us the truth about the world. So what do I wanna do? I wanna be part of building things that do that work. I would be lying to you if I sat here and told you that I know the exact shape of that. I don't know if it's gonna be a new newspaper, a new, um, a new publishing house, a new podcasting network, but that's what I wanna be a part of. And the problem that I see right now um, in the sort of media landscape, which is the thing I know best, um, although you know, if someone starts a new university, I think it'd be super cool to teach there. Um, but right now what's going on in the media world is that some of the very smartest, present company excluded, um, most free thinking, um, independent-minded journalists and pundits are not accessible in mainstream channels. They're not invited on CNN. They're not invited on MSNBC. They're not invited on Fox because they don't fit the Rachel Maddow or the Tucker Carlson view of the world. So there's this center that is sort of unrepresented. Um, and right now, if you want to find those people, you need to have a Twitter account you need to subscribe to certain newsletters. You need to download certain podcasts. For someone like me that lives online, that's a, that's a solution that works. But for people like my parents and for most, most Americans that do not live on Twitter, that's not any kind of solution. So the extent that I can be part of bringing those people together and creating a common address for common sense, 
that idea really, really excites me. Now, I also want to say, and this is where I sort of put myself, my own self on the hook when I say think Zionistically, it would be very easy for me right now um, to, you know, start a podcast and call it a day um, because I think it could do well and, you know, it'd be fun for me. But that's not ambitious enough given the scope of the problems that we face. And so what I'm saying is, I don't know if a, a project like this will be successful. It's certainly really, really ambitious, but I feel the obligation to try to do something really audacious because that's what I think the moment calls for. Um, and what excites me is to see um, other young people, especially thinking in exactly the same way. I'm, you might not be able to build a great newspaper in the span of a few years, like you might be able to build a podcast, but can you do it over 10 years? Can you do it over 20? Can you do it over 30? Maybe. And when I think back, and this is where like Jewish history is my kind of compass and my, my moral map for myself, could be crushed when you think about the kind of problems besetting the world at the moment. I'm talking to you from Los Angeles where the sun is literally blotted out because of smoke. My, my fiance and I had to leave Northern California because of the ash falling from the sky. So that's just, there's a lot of problems right now. But when I think back to what the kind of problems our ancestors faced and the, the way that history buffeted them, that puts everything in perspective. And when I see what they were able to do, the way that, you know, the way that they rebuilt Yavne after the temple was destroyed, the way that they drained the swamps and built the land of Israel after they were forced out of their homes because of pogroms, well, then leaving the New York Times does not seem like that big of a deal, quite frankly. Very good point. Okay, so what are your feelings about the increasing anti-Semitism or anti-Jewishness and the far left in the world today? And do you think that in the American Jewish community, there's something to worry about uh, in the similar vein that we saw what happened in Britain? Yes, which is why I'm speaking out about it. Um, and I, I think my opening comments really spoke to this. Um, I hope it goes without saying, and those who have seen me um, talk on Bill Maher or read my book or read my many columns or understand the reasons why I left the journal, I carry no water for this president. And I believe that the way, I'm, I'm only addressing it in the opposite way because we haven't really talked about anti-Semitism from the right. Um, obviously this president has done lots of things that the pro-Israel community can cheer. He, I mean, the, the, the historic peace agreement between the UAE and Israel, it's unbelievable. The moving of the embassy to Jerusalem, the recognition of the Golan Heights, these are all great things. And yet, this president has also dismantled the moral guardrails that keep bigotry down. And he has flirted with conspiracy theories in a way that has been if not directly aimed at the Jews, has been a siren song for, for anti-Semites. Um, and so I see it sort of happening and coming at us from both directions. I see a political center, which is where Jews have generally lived, let's say on the center left and the center right, collapsing. I see us increasingly politically homeless. Um, and listen, I'm not an expert in partisan politics. If I was, I would be solving it there. What I am really good at, I think, is creating um, is creating a home um, for the common sense center that right now is homeless. And so I see my efforts at trying to combat this as, as being in the media, but I hope and I know that lots of other people are trying to address this problem in lots of other ways. Um, what I know is that a strategy in which we, as I said before, in which we sit on our hands, in which we, we pretend that this is not happening, in which we pretend that, you know, sort of the golden years of post-war American Jewry or North American Jewry still exist, exist, I'm sorry, that's a strategy that will lead to only more of what we're seeing now. Interesting. All right. So I'm looking at the time and I've been given very strict guidelines on time and all the rest of it. So two last questions, not political questions, because we've answered the far left. We've talked about anti-Semitism and Zionism. We've talked about uh, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, et cetera. So to, a couple of simple, simple ones sort of to end the show a little bit. On the, uh, let's say on a, 
fluffier, a happier sort of, uh, sort of note. Number one, okay, here's the first one and then the second one. The first one is, you've had the honor and the privilege um, of spending a good deal of time with Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. What's that like? Oh my God. I, a lot of exciting things have happened to me in the past few years of my life. I've met some really interesting people, um, but there are two things that were sort of peak moments, I would say, of my entire life. One was being asked to write the introduction to his latest collection of essays. He's a new book, Morality, but he has another book. It's a collection of um, Divrei Torah that I wrote the introduction to, and that was, getting that email was the honor of my life. Uh, and the other was the day that I left the New York Times, getting a call on my cell phone from Natan Sharansky, who is one of my all-time um, all heroes. And, and people often ask me, a question. I get a lot of hate online. For those of you who are online, you know that. Um, and I've gotten hate sometimes in real life. And oftentimes I get the question, especially from younger Jews who want to stand up um, for the Jewish people. I'll just say broadly defined and stand up for liberal values broadly defined. Stand up against the kind of extremism that we're seeing on both sides of the political divide. And they ask me, you know, how do you withstand it? And really my answer is that one voice like that, one call like that, knowing that I have someone like Natan Sharansky or Jonathan Sachs or Majid Nawaz in my corner, well, that means more to me than anything. And that kind of, I mean, to use the language of the upcoming high holidays, like that's those still small voices, those drown out all of the noise online. And I would say if there's any young people watching this, I wish I could see who's on this call. I wish I could be in the room with all of you. Find those people. And I would say I try to the extent that I can to be that voice um, that others, I, I try and be that voice and that support, um, especially um, to, to high school and college students who, are, as you can imagine, I increasingly hear from. Mm. So I'm going to apologize to everybody again. There were so many questions and I would I'm just so throw, just picking a few of them out. Um, really amazing. So last question, and that's my cue. Someone is going to cue up from that. So last question, I heard a rumor. And if the rumor is true, maybe you could just give a quick comment to something about the view. Is that a TV show that? Yeah, I love it. I've, I've, um, I've guest hosted the view before. And uh, as people might know, Megan McCain is going on maternity leave soon. And she tweeted something nice about how she'd be thrilled for me to take her place. I don't know if that's gonna happen, but you know, I, I always welcome the chance to sit across from Wolfie Goldberg and frankly, the chance um, to talk to the kind of people that watch The View, which is a different audience than I would say reads the op-ed pages of the New York Times. Um, I'm interested in going on any platform to reach the largest number of people as possible. and um, and, and standing up for the values that have really made this country an exception, right? There's a lot of forces in this country from a lot of corners that are trying to sort of pull us back into the mean of history. And America, for all of its imperfections, is an incredible departure from history. It is, there is, not, it is not a coincidence that our countries have been the greatest diaspora experience the world has ever known. And I think it's on us right now not just to fight for those values as Jews because we care about the thriving of Jews in America and Canada, but because we care about America and Canada. And we know from our history that countries that cannot protect their Jewish citizens, countries where Jews do not have the freedom, not just to survive, but to thrive, are countries that are dead or dying. And it is my mission to make sure that we don't get to that point. So the person who's supposed to come on next, actually, I just got an email that says that she's frozen. So I'm going to take advantage of that. Oh, sure. Of course. Uh, but, but yet you can hear me. Oh, we can hear you. Okay, let me ask one more question because it's come up so many times as I'm scrolling through. Will you please just comment on the power and attraction of the squad in the Democratic Party? Sure. I mean, I would say that um, the political energy right now in America, let's put Trumpism to the side for a second. The political energy on the left lies with the squad. And I remember that I used to, I, you know, a year, two years ago, I'm getting to arguments with 
sort of people of my parents' generation and older who would say, what are you talking about? In the face of the Democratic Party is Nancy Pelosi. The face of the Democratic Party is Chuck Schumer. And I would say, no, it's not. No, it's not. The face of the Democratic Party is AOC. And not Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib as much, um, but I would, or Ayanna Presley to some extent, but it's really, really AOC. To me, the reasons for it are absolutely clear. She's incredible at what she does. She's gorgeous. She's articulate. Um, she's a powerhouse. And I don't think it's a coincidence that people are attracted to, to charisma and to um, true belief, which I really think she has. Now, we can argue about her ideas. And a lot of her ideas, obviously, I depart from wholeheartedly. But what I think is important is to understand why people are drawn to her. Um, I think the reasons are obvious. And then think about who are the leaders we can be supporting, elevating, training, helping to support as they run for elected office that have those qualities, but have different ideas. So Barry, that was great. I'm turning you over to Nikki now and saying good night. Hi, Nikki. Nikki. Hi, I don't know where to start. You've taken us through this roller coaster of almost so sad to ready to come and join you and dance down the streets and get excited behind you. And I know I say that for myself because that's how I feel. And the over 450 people that have been on this call this evening with 57 questions to go. So if you want to- I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Um, So thank you. We want to all thank you for your time, for your dedication. We know uh, a little bit about you uh, personally now, a little bit about your uh, appreciation for, it looks like Earth and NASA from behind you. Um, and that's cool? the really- I'm in a rental, but um, it's the little kid's toys, but I, I thought they were awesome. It's, it's a little bit of- It's, good, Stransky's, you know, you know, it's Stransky's book next to, next to USA. Exactly. We feel like we've come at, kind of entered your home. So there is a positive part to COVID, even though it's a rental. Um, we can't thank you enough. We hope that this is the first of many. I speak on behalf of the Addith Israel community and congregation. Obviously, we want to thank as well the programming committee and the staff led by uh, Phil David. Thank you so much for putting this together and obviously to Richard Bogorosh uh, for sponsoring the Anne and Joseph Bogorosh uh, Memorial Lecture Series. Very, this gave us something to think about as we go into Rosh Hashanah services, whichever way we decide to do it this year. And one thing that I kept thinking about is they can put a mask on us, but they can't stop our sound. And you are showing that, that that is just the way to do it. So thank you so much for everything tonight and wishing everybody a Shana Tovah Shana Tovah to all of you. Thank you.